Hello, this is Chuck Ridgway, Automation Technology Manager at Horner. Thanks for joining us for another Tuesday live stream. Now, like I've said many times on this channel, I love it when we get topic requests from viewers. Just last week, we had a topic request from Market Process Solutions who wanted to know the optimal approach for doing analog totalizing with the Horner OCS all-in-one controller. If you haven't checked that out yet, I'd recommend you do so. Now this week we have another topic request. Here it is. Introducing the Seascape drum sequencer user defined function block. Now the request for a drum sequencer in Seascape came from Horner customer Mike Lloyd 20 years ago. Now I have to admit over my long career at Horner, this is one of my ultimate fails in terms of customer response time. Uh, but back in the day when I was the product manager at Horner, uh, I got the request from Mike. And as the product manager, I had the ability to write the specification and get it scheduled with engineering, but I just didn't get that done. Epic fail on my part, but better late than never. Now, some of you may say, well, geez, after 20 years, why bother? Well, drum sequencers are just as viable today as they ever were. There's still plenty of applications we're having the drum sequencer or a drum sequencer at the heart of your control strategy is a great approach. So we're gonna cover it today. Again, better late than never. All right, let's take a look at how we're breaking down today's topic. So we're gonna start with what is a drum sequencer and where is it used? We're gonna talk about how a drum sequencer is configured both traditionally and in more modern times. We're also gonna to introduce to you a new user-defined function block which performs drum sequencing in Seascape, and there'll be plenty of demonstrations throughout. Let's get started. So what is a drum sequencer? Well, the traditional definition is an electromechanical system for controlling a sequence of events automatically. So the way electromechanical drum sequencers were constructed is they consisted of an electric motor, and that electric motor turned either a series of cams or a drum that was studded with pegs and the cams or the drum were turned at a consistent slow speed and then as the cam or the drum turned a series of switches were associated with each cam position or each pin location and then by controlling the timing and the sequence of your switches basically controlling where your cams line up and where your pins are installed, repetitive operations can be controlled. So that's a traditional electromechanical drum sequencer. Here's a look, that previous picture was the picture of a cam-based sequencer. Here's an actual drum sequencer, a drawing of one. Basically, you can see the drum, that cylindrical drum there as a main part of the graphic. Everywhere you see red dots, that indicates there's a pin that's been installed in that location. And there are up to 16 pins from left to right. And each location left to right lines up with a normally open switch. And if, as that drum rotates by the switches, if there's a pin installed in that location, that corresponding switch will turn on. And if there's an empty space in that location, that switch will be off. So that's how, by installing or uninstalling pins, you can effectively configure a drum sequencer. Where were drum sequencers used? Well, they were used in all sorts of devices, a lot of which were not industrial. Things like music boxes and player pianos and even pinball machines. Washing machines, of course, is probably the best known application, that dial, the old-fashioned dial that would click as you turned it. That effectively was a drum sequencer. And really, even back in the day, the industrial control of any machine that required a series of sequential steps, a drum sequencer very likely was the way in which that was configured or the way that was controlled. So now let's take a look at a drum sequencer past the electromechanical days. So the newer definition of a drum sequencer is a PLC function block, which simulates the function of an electromechanical drum sequencer in logic. And because it's done in logic, they can have a lot more flexibility and a lot more programmability than what you would find in electromechanical version. And they're still in use today. And really any application 
where you have a series of repetitive steps in the machine or the process. And it is more than just a couple, three steps. If you're doing a couple, three steps, you can do those manually with state logic, and that's pretty simple. If you've got a bunch of steps to do, six, eight, 10, whatever the case may be, a drum sequencer is generally going to be easier to configure than doing everything manually. So again, getting back to how drum sequencers are configured, remember that traditional drum sequencer, it was a matter of placing those pegs at all the locations where you wanted the output to turn on, or at least all the states in which you wanted the outputs to turn on and establishing the output pattern that way. The timing of the traditional drum sequencer was all based on the continuous speed of that motor. So everything was effectively timer based with a traditional drum sequencer. So every time you moved from step to step, it was always because the motor had turned to the next step based on that timing. With our drum sequencer logic instruction that's available in modern PLCs, we've got a ton more flexibility than that. So here's the sequence or the process we'll follow to configure our drum sequencer instruction, or at least to take a look at our application and see how it correlates to our drum sequencer instruction. We start out by determining how does our sequence start and end? What kicks it off? What wraps it up at the end? Then we need to determine each individual step in the sequence of our machine. What's happening in each step? What is the individual steps? Then for each individual step in the sequence, we need to determine which outputs need to be on and which outputs need to be off. That's called an output pattern. And for every individual step, we need to take a look and see what causes that step to advance to the next step. Now, back in the traditional days, it was always time-based and it was always kind of a fixed speed, right? Whereas in today's world, what causes you to advance to the next step could be, again, a timeout. It could also be a particular event that occurs that causes you to move to the next step. So much more flexibility today. So now let's take a look at an example of a, I don't know, let's call it a industrial washer. Okay, And it's a greatly simplified example, one that I think will be illustrative of how to use a drum sequencer. So determine how the sequence starts and ends. In our example, we're gonna start it with a start button and we're gonna end it after the wash sequence is complete by pressing a button that unlocks the washer so that we can open up the door and, and unload it. That's how we're gonna start and end our example sequence. Now here's all the steps in my example washer. We're gonna fill with water. We're gonna inject some soap. We're gonna agitate and mix for a while. Then when we're done with that cycle, we're gonna drain. We're gonna fill with more water, agitate and mix some more, drain again, and then we're gonna call that good. Now I know I didn't do a spin cycle and I know I didn't do any kind of drying or anything. Again, it's an example, greatly simplified one. So now that we've determined which steps we have in our sequence, now we have to determine which outputs need to be on during each step. Now, in a typical application, it may be that you have one or two or three outputs on in a particular step, or maybe no outputs on a particular step. Um, in my application, it just so turns out that I never have more than one output on per step, but that's just my particular example. Definitely not a limitation with sequencers. So when I'm filling, anytime I'm filling my washer, I have a fill valve that's going to be on. While I'm injecting soap, I've got an injection valve I'm turning on. When we're mixing or agitating, I've got a mixer I'm turning on. And when we're draining, I've got a drain valve that is turning on. So that's all the different outputs that need to be on for each of the eight states. And at the very end, you can see when I'm complete with everything, all my outputs are off. What's going to cause each individual step to move to the next step? In my example, I'm going to follow the traditional drum sequencer approach where everything is time-based. So to go from the fill step to the inject step, it's all going to be about elapsed time, for instance. So I'm counting on the fact I have a constant stream of water when I turn my fill valve on that I know after 30 seconds I have the right amount of water. That may not be how I want my real application to work. In my real application, I may decide to use a water level switch for the fill instead. So I don't have to use strictly time-based transitions I can use a combination of time or events. 
now let's talk specifically about the drum sequencer user defined function block that we've designed that you can import into any variable based advanced ladder project in Seascape. Now we've named it dseq underscore 16q, indicating it's a drum sequencer with 16 outputs. It has 16 steps as well. So you, again, you can have up to 16 steps in the sequence and each step can control up to 16 outputs. And to advance from step to step, it can either be time-based or it can be event-based, or of course, every individual step can be one or the other or both actually. Any user-defined function block has inputs and outputs. Frankly, every function block has inputs and outputs. So let's go through those now. Let's start with the inputs. We've got an enable input that starts the sequence. Whenever we're enabled and when we're first enabled, we start out with step one and we kick off the process. There's a reset input that can be used at any time to reset the sequence back to step one. And as long as it's held in, it's gonna stay in the initialization state and never advance. Now, in my example, I'm not doing anything with the reset input. There's also an event input. This is the input, the digital input, that you need to turn on for any step in which an event is gonna cause it to advance. So it's got one event input, so if you have two or three different steps that advance on an event, you're gonna have parallel logic to control the event digital input to the function block to cause it to turn on at the appropriate steps at the appropriate conditions. The next input is called steps. It's an integer that you simply set to the maximum number of steps in your sequence. So if you've got an eight step sequence like I do, I'm gonna set the steps variable to an eight. Next, let's talk timing. We have a time base input. This is the integer that effectively tells the drum sequencer what the time base is for its master step timer. As you would expect, because there's timing going on with steps, there is a master timer built in to the user defined function block and all timers in Seascape need to have a time base either of one millisecond, 10 millisecond, 100 milliseconds or one second. And so the time base variable is an input that tells the drum sequencer what the time base is. Next, there is a timer set point array. What's that? Well, that's an array of 16 timer set points, one per step. So for every step that is going to advance based on a timer set point, you would set its set point to the appropriate element in that array. So for the first step, its timer set point is the first element in the timer set point array. Now, if you have a step which is to advance strictly on an event and not on a timer, you would set that timer set point to zero. Next we have what's called a wait flag array, which is an array of 16 bits where every bit represents a wait flag for each step. What is that? Well, you might have a scenario where you don't want to advance past a step unless both a timer set point and the event input turn on. In that scenario, you need to tell the drum sequencer, hey, this particular step needs to wait for both to happen. So you need to set the wait flag for that particular step. So that's how that works. And again, in my application, I'm not gonna be doing anything with the wait flags since all of my advancements are done based on time. Next, let's talk about Q pattern array or output pattern array. What's that? Well, remember for every step in your sequence, and there's 16 steps potentially, you have an output pattern that you're gonna set your outputs to, or the drum sequencer is gonna set its outputs to. So that means there are 16 bits per step for setting each of the 16 outputs. So that's an array of 16 integers where the least significant bit in each integer is the first output, and the most significant bit in each integer is the last output or the 16th output. Finally, our last input is a jog input. What's that? Well, that's a digital input that we can use at any time to manually advance past any step. So regardless how that step is configured to normally advance, if you hit that jog input in an off to on transition, you're gonna move to the next step automatically or actually manually because you manually turned it on. Now let's get into the outputs of our drum sequencer UDFB. We've got a done bit. Well, that turns on when the sequence is complete. Makes sense. We have a step num integer. 
What is that? Well, that's an integer value that tells you what step number you're on. So if we're on sequencers on step five in the sequence, then you're going to get a five under step number. Step time. Well, that's the current elapsed time for the current step. It's basically a peak at the accumulator of the master step timer. So if you have your time base configured for one second or a thousand milliseconds, and you're reading a value of five for your step time, it means you're five seconds in or you've elapsed for five seconds in your current step. Finally, or almost finally, we have our output array. So that is a Boolean array or array of 16 bits, which is the current state at any given time of those 16 outputs that are controlled by the drum sequencer. So that's what we have with the output array. And then finally, we have a status word or a status integer. So that's a unsigned integer that indicates the current status of the sequencer at any given time. So if you make a mistake and you configure an illegal number of steps or an illegal time base, it'll enunciate that. If the sequencer is not enabled, it'll enunciate that. And no matter where you are in your sequence, whatever you're waiting on to advance, it's going to give you that status as well. So very useful to be sure. Now we're going to marry that industrial washer example I was talking about with our user-defined function block drum sequencer. So what I've done is I've got a table there on the screen where I've laid out what happens on each of the eight steps. I've kind of given a description for each of the eight steps. I have documented which outputs need to be on for each step. And I've also documented what causes that step to be complete or what causes it to advance to the next step. And in my example, everything is time-based, and I've documented the amount of time, elapsed time, to cause the advancement to occur. So now let's take a look at how we would configure our user-defined function block. Let's start with that enable input. I want to kick off my sequence when the start button is pressed, so I'm going to basically write a tiny little bit of ladder logic to make that happen. So I'm going to turn the enable bit on when my start push button is pressed, and I'm going to turn off that enable when my unlock push button is pressed, saying that, okay, we're done with the sequence and I want to unload my washer. Okay, I'm not doing anything with reset in the example. I'm not doing anything with the event input in my example. But for the number of steps, I'm going to set that to 8. Next, I'm going to set my time base to 1,000 milliseconds or 1 second, a value of 1,000. And I need to take that table I initially created that shows what my timeouts are for each particular step, and I need to turn that into my timer set point array, which I've drawn there at the bottom, where the first element is the timeout for the first step, the next element is the timeout for the second step, moving from left to right, steps 1 through 15, elements 0 through 15. And you'll see that since I'm not using steps beyond number 8, I'm zero filling the remainder of that array. Now let's talk about our output pattern. This is probably the most complicated part of setting up a drum sequencer. It's not that complicated, but it's something you need to follow a, a series of steps for. In my example, I have four outputs that are shown in that table on the left. I have a fill valve, a injector, a mixer, and a drain valve. So outputs one through four is what I'm using in my example. Now, I've taken my table in the center there, and I've drawn in the middle of it kind of the output pattern in binary for each of my four outputs, depending on which step I'm on. If I'm filling, only Q1 is on. If I'm injecting soap, only Q2 is on in my case. So I completed for each of the eight steps the binary pattern for the four outputs I'm using in my application. And then I took that binary, converted it to a decimal number, and put that in the rightmost column there. So that is the integer value for my output pattern array that I need to set in my application. And I've drawn that there at the very bottom. So you can see that from left to right, the first step or the first element in the array is the output pattern for the first step. And all the way to the right, which is the 16th step, which we're not executing because we don't have that many steps, but I've set that to zero because that correlates to the last step, the output pattern I need for the last step. So that's how we build our output pattern array. 
next, let's go ahead and take a look at Seascape and how I've actually configured this up for my example. So here we are. So what I have here, let me find my mouse, there we go, is I have my washer example that's built around our user-defined function block, the DC16Q. And I'll show you how to do this all from scratch here in a minute, but I'm starting out with this kind of pre-baked program, if you will. So graphically, let me show you what, what's happening with the application first. So graphically, I've built this screen that's showing my washer status. And for each of the time, the timer set points for each of my steps, I have made those so they can be changed on the fly. So I can adjust my fill time, timeout, my drain time, timeout, my inject time, timeout. All those can be configured from individual variables from the screen at any point if I want to make adjustments to my process. Here are the valves or the outputs that I'm controlling, right? I've got a I've got a fill valve, a drain valve, a soap injector valve shown graphically here. And then I've also got this mixer icon here that is sometimes visible and sometimes not. So that's what's happening. And then I have a start button to kick off my process or my sequence. And then after everything is done, I'll have the done light turn on and then I can press the unlock button so I can unload the washer and get ready for the next cycle. Let's take a look at my logic here. So remember, the first thing we have to do besides making sure the always on contact is feeding the user defined function block, the first thing we have to do is to make sure enable is on when we want to kick off a process. So I've built a simple start stop circuit here where I turn enable on with the start push button, seal it in of course, and then I turn it off with the unlock push button. So that's what's going to cause my function block to be enabled and then ultimately disabled at the end. Now I have mentioned that I'm not doing anything with reset or event, but the rest of these or many of the rest of these I need to configure. So let's start by setting our number of steps to eight with a simple move instruction and our time base to a thousand milliseconds with another move instruction. Okay, so those are now properly set. Next, I need to set my set point variables for my timer set point array. So this is how many seconds effectively it's going to be for each step to expire. And I have eight steps. So I've got eight different move instructions I'm doing here. So here's my first element, which is for the first step, the second element for the second step, and so on and so forth for a total of eight move statements. Now, in my case, these variable times can be set from the screen, from those data objects I showed you. So I'm actually moving those variables or copying those variables over to the appropriate element of the timer set point array. And then once I get down to the end, for the last eight elements, I'm using a fill command or a fill instruction to write a zero to the unused elements of the timer set point array. Because remember, I have eight steps, not 16, that I'm actually using in this case. So I just went ahead and filled the rest of them with zero. Next, I need to input my output pattern for the sequencer. So to do this, I'm using that constant move. Remember, this is where I created that table. I drew in the binary pattern, and then I converted that binary pattern over to decimal values. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into the output pattern array the appropriate output pattern decimal values for each of the 16 steps. And of course, I'm only using eight of the steps. There's what we have for the first seven steps, and then the eighth step, all my outputs are off, and then I filled the rest of them with zeros. Finally, what I need to do is I need to take the outputs coming from my sequencer, and I'm going to scroll up and show you those there. The outputs coming from my sequencer is being written to the output array, which is eight bits in an array starting, I'm sorry, 16 bits, in an array starting at zero. So element zero through element 15. And then down here, I've done some simple move logic to copy over the first four output array bits over to the real world variables that I need. Fill valve, a soap inject valve, agitator, and drain valve. And down here in my global variable area, 
I'll scroll down and show you that for each of those four variables, output variables, I've mapped them to real world output points. And I happen to map them in order. I didn't have to do that, but I went ahead and did that. So that is the configuration or my example program here for my industrial washer. Let's take a look at it in action. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to my benchtop view. And we're sitting here ready to go. All my set points have been configured for each of my steps. I went ahead and added a view at the current step time. And also kind of I created a text table showing me what was happening right now. And of course, nothing's running. So not running is my current status. I'm going to kick things off with the start button. And you can see our fill valve went green. And we're graphically showing that we're filling our tub, our wash tub. And that fill time is 15 seconds. So at the end of 15 seconds, we're injecting soap for only three seconds. And then we dive into the wash cycle or where we turn on the mixer slash agitator. That goes for 10 seconds. Uh, then we need to drain. A draining is taking 15 seconds. That's how we've got it configured. Once we're done draining, and you can see the drain valve is on while we're draining. Once we're done draining, we need to fill again because we need to rinse. That's the next step in our sequence. After the 15 second fill time expires, then we're going to move on to our agitator step again so that we can kind of rinse things off for 10 seconds. And then when that's done, we're going to drain again. And that's starting now. So we've got 15 seconds for the draining to complete. And then when that's done, we are at the kind of complete stage, which we've set to last for, I think, uh, just a short one second or so. And then the done light turns on. Now, we can't actually run another sequence. We're done with our sequence. That's what that done bit says. We can't actually run another sequence until we unlock or disable our drum sequencer. That's how I've set this particular application up. And then it's ready for me to start it up again. So that is my washer example using our drum sequencer user defined function block. Now let's go ahead and take a look at how we would add our drum sequencer to a new application. So we're going to start from scratch and take a look at what we need to do from a new application. So I'm going to go ahead and close this application here. Uh, I didn't really change anything significantly, so I'll say no there. And I'm going to start with a new application. I'll hit new. And I need a variable based advanced ladder project in order to use this drum sequencer, UDFB. And the first thing I need to do is I need to actually import that UDFB into this current project. So how do I do that? Well, anytime you want to import a logic module, whether it's a subroutine or a main loop module or a UDFB, you highlight logic modules and then right click and you say import logic module. And then you need to navigate to the folder containing the CPU file. And then you need to tell Cscape to look for a .cpu file, select it and say open. So it's added the dseq underscore 16q under UDFB modules, and it's, it's immediately opened up a new tab and shows me all the logic. Now, I chose not to protect this UDFB so that you could take a look at the logic, you know, and see how I did it. But generally, in this case, I don't care about the logic inside the drum sequencer. I'm going to go ahead and close this particular tab because, again, I'm not interested in the logic within the drum sequencer. I just want to apply it. The next thing I'm going to do is before I actually add the drum sequencer to my project in terms of the actual function block in my logic, I'm going to add some variables that I'm going to use to actually assign to the drum sequencer inputs and outputs. And what I've done is actually I have given you guys a little bit of a shortcut here. And under drum sequencer standard variable names, I have a text file that just has all the standard variable names for the drum sequencer. Now, this is a step you don't have to take. You can create all your own variables that you would use to map into your user defined function block. But I'll show you in a little while while I chose to take this approach. So I've copied 
those particular variables. Let's go ahead and open up my program variable window. And I'm going to add those under retained variables. So I'm going to right click and say edit variables as text. And then I'm going to paste in with a control V that variable list. And there it is. So now those variables are all in my project. And I can choose, if I wish, and I do wish, and I'll tell you why later, I'm going to choose to use the same variable names externally that are used for the inputs and outputs internally on the user-defined function block. Let's go ahead and add it in now. So I'm going to start with an always-on contact because with UDFBs, we typically do want them to always be enabled or at least always be receiving power. That's a better way to put that. And then to add an instance of my UDFB, I go to my toolbox under UDFB, select the drum sequencer, which is there now because I did import it. I'm going to go ahead and place it. And then the first thing it wants me to do is to name this particular instance, because we can have multiple instances of UDFBs if we had multiple pieces of equipment that needed to be controlled with different sequencers. I'm just going to name this instant washer. And then it's asking me to define all the inputs and outputs. This is where you can either assign your own variable names you know, to map to the inputs and outputs. Some of them can just be constants. If it's always going to be constants, they don't have to be variables. But in my case, I'm going to assign the exact same variable names, which effectively match the ones I just imported. And for all of them that are arrays, I'm not only going to specify the array name, but the first element of the array. All the ones that are arrays actually end in AY. That was to be consistent in the naming convention and to make it easy for people to understand that it's actually an array that they are referencing with the input. Again, I'm just naming everything the same. And this is another array here. So I need that first element to be shown. If I've typed everything in properly, it should just take it. Now, it's a long user-defined function block, so i got to scroll down to find the OK button. There it is. And I typed everything properly, so everything is set up and ready to go. Let me explain why I decided to use the exact same variable names on the outside as I did on the inside. It's something I do during testing all the time when I create a UDFB, so it's a little bit of a carryover from that. But the other reason is that I've created this handy-dandy Seascape graphics group that I can use to actually configure most of the parameters of this drum sequencer. So I'm going to go to a new screen. Now I'm doing screen one here. Normally I would probably do screen 10 or uh, probably not the main screen. But I'm going to go under groups and hit import groups. And then I'm going to navigate to my desktop to the folder that contains the group, the graphics group that I want to place on the screen. Now, you'll notice when I import this, wow, this thing is really complicated. Really what I've done is I've drawn all 16 potential steps with all 16 potential outputs along with all the configuration parameters for our drum sequencer. And the reason I use the same variable names coming in and out of the drum sequencer is so they would match up with the variable names I chose for this graphic object. So there we go. Now there's one other thing I have to configure that doesn't come in with the group, and that is I've got this status text table here, and I need to add in the text table elements, but those are also available to import. So I'll click on text table, go to text table number one, and hit import. And then again, back in that folder, there's all my different status. That's the decoding of all the status information that I'm getting back. I say OK and OK. And then this is always a good point to do an error check. So let me do, I'm going to go ahead and close the graphic object and I'm, uh, or graphics window, and I'm going to do an error check here to see if I've made any mistakes. And I have not, wonderfully enough. So let me close that down. So now I'm ready to go ahead and download this and just try it out because of the nature of that graphics group that I created. I can actually configure most aspects of the drum sequencer right from the screen, at least for testing purposes. 
So what I'm going to do, because this is a drastically different program than what's already running in the OCS that it's on my desktop, I'm going to go ahead and clear the memory. So I'm going to go ahead and go to controller, clear memory, and I'm going to clear both the program and all the registers and the variables out of the controller. I'm doing that because I'm downloading a completely different program into it. And I want to make sure all my variables start initialized and not with old values left over from old memory locations. The other thing I have to do to make sure I don't run into trouble in my example is since I am programming over Ethernet, I need to make sure that I've got my IP address set properly for the unit that I'm actually going to be, oops, I've got that reversed, for the unit that I'm actually going to be talking to on my bench. So it's got an address of 0 0.253. That way, when I'm halfway through my download, I don't lose communication because the IP address has changed. So I'm downloading this new test program that's just got my one instance of my UDFB with the default variables that I created and then with that configuration graphic on screen one. And then the other thing I can't forget is because I cleared out the memory in advance, I got to remember to restart and put back into run mode my OCS. So it's not quite done downloading yet. As soon as it is, I'm going to put that OCS into run mode. There we go. And then I'm going to switch to my bench view. Let's do that. There we go. So as you can see, that's quite a busy screen, but I can do all kinds of configuration from here. So I'm going to set my total number of steps to eight. Okay. I'm going to set my time base to a thousand milliseconds. I'm going to set my output pattern. And my output pattern is for my first step, I need output one to be on. Then we go to output two, three, then four. Then we're going to one. The next step skips over our soap injection, goes right to the output three, and then we go to output four. And then our last step has no outputs on at all. Okay, now the next thing to do is to configure the timer set points for each step. So let's say that our Fill time is going to be 15 seconds, and our inject time is going to be 3 seconds, and our agitator time, let's say, is going to be 20 seconds, and then we need to drain, let's say that's going to take 15 seconds. Again, we're, we're back to filling again, and then we are agitating again, and then we are draining again. Okay, and then my last step is my complete step. And in my case, I'm just going to put a one second timeout in here so that as soon as I turn all my outputs off, one second later, I can turn on that done flag or that done bit and I am complete. Okay, so I've basically configured this sequencer all from this screen here. The only thing I really haven't done is I haven't taken any of these real world outputs, okay, or I haven't taken any of this, the sequencer outputs and map them to real world outputs. But right from here, I could go ahead and enable the sequencer. And then I can follow along with step one and the current step time. And I can follow along as we work through the sequencer. And here's my current status. I'm waiting for a timer or an event. So once I get past my fill time, I'm going to move to step two. There I am. I'm injecting soap. And literally, I can just follow right along here with everything I'm doing. And if I want to cycle the event input or cycle the jog input as a test, I can do that here as well. So that is effectively showing you how from scratch you can import the UDFB, you can use it in your program, you can even import a pre-drawn configuration object on a screen and use that to configure everything if you'd like. Next, let's go ahead and wrap things up for today. Okay, so as a wrap up, remember drum sequencers are a practical logic function for sequential machine operations. If you have two or three steps, it's probably not worth the setup effort to do a drum sequencer. But if you have half a dozen steps or more, I would recommend you take a look and evaluate potentially using a drum sequencer. Uh, it really can simplify things. Drum sequencers will advance through a series of steps with an output pattern specified at each step. Drum sequencers advance from step to step through either a timeout expiring 
for an external event happening or both. Remember, that's what the wait flag was for, is to tell the drum sequencer it needs to wait for both the event input and the timer to expire. And the drum sequencer that we've created for you that is now available in the comment section, attached to the comment section, can be used by you to add to any one of your projects written using variable-based advanced ladder. Now, this is the part of the show where I tell you that we're here every Tuesday at two o'clock, whether we're fully live like today or whether we are streaming live a pre-recorded video. But whether we're streaming live or fully live, we have people standing by to answer any questions you have in the chat section. And if you're watching on replay, like a lot of you do, we'd love to have your comments and questions in the comment section and we'll get back to you very quickly on those. Next week, it's gonna be a fun show. It's not gonna be super serious. It's gonna be super fun. We're not gonna cover a topic per se, other than the fact we're gonna review a little bit what happened in 2022 from a product release standpoint and that sort of thing. But we're gonna spend a bunch of our time making fun of ourselves, showing some blooper reels. Definitely, you're gonna to wanna to see that. It made me look pretty silly a lot of times. You're also gonna to wanna to see some blooper reels from my colleague, Nate Beachy. His are way more entertaining than mine. We think you'll enjoy that as well. And we've got some highlights from throughout the year, but it's gonna be a fun show next week. We encourage you to watch it just for a little bit of comic relief. Here's a reminder that we've combined on our single YouTube channel for Horner APG, we've combined both automation content and lighting content. So don't forget to check out the Horner Lighting Group videos. There's now plenty of those available on our YouTube channel. For those of you who haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to our channel. It doesn't cost anything. And if you choose notifications when you subscribe, you'll be notified every time we go live or every time we post a new video. And that number is well up over 100 videos for this year, 50 of which are our Tuesday live stream. So it was a good year for live streams to be sure. Okay, so I hope everyone out there has had and is enjoying continuously a happy holiday season. And until next week, let's all get out there and let's do us some good. Mm -hmm.